Ryan at scale. My name is Alexander. I work at Piotel. I'm Kai Ting Chen from VMware. Today we'll talk about using CFCR to run your Quest clusters. This is the most important slide. You'll remember it from today because you'll see it on all presentations. But yeah, why are we here? Who here have deployed something using Bosch? Please raise your hands. Okay, who haven't deployed? Because I see lots of hands. Haven't deployed something? Okay. So I, I expect that all of you agree that Bosch is awesome to deploy things and it's awesome deployment system. And the thing is that is Cloud Foundry container runtime just another Bosch deployment that if you know how to deploy with Bosch, you can do it? And the answer is yes. It's just another Bosch deployment. A bit fancy with, that uses some extra Bosch features, but it's just another Bosch deployment. So um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit, because this is, this is the first uh, session of the day about why we want to, why we're even here talking about Kubernetes. What does Kubernetes give you in addition to your existing Cloud Foundry infrastructure? So there's a couple of things. The abstraction that Kubernetes built is fundamentally at a lower level than what you're going to see out of the application runtime. It handles, it deals with pods, which are essentially just co-located containers. And it also means that you can essentially run any existing Docker container you have. So if you have some functionality that, that is already easily represented as a Docker container, well, Kubernetes makes it very easy for you to run that. It handles the replication and scaling of those containers automatically for you. And um, I mean, Kubernetes is a little bit more tied into the underlying infrastructure. For example, if you have something like uh, uh, some persistent disks in your vSphere infrastructure, for example, that you want to use with your, with your workloads, then Kubernetes makes it very easy to, to make that integration happen. And last, Kubernetes supports uh, rolling updates for your workloads. It makes it very easy for users in addition to access all of these features. So that's why we're here to talk about Kubernetes. But the problem with giving you all this power and, and having these low-level abstractions is that Kubernetes is very difficult to install in, in a production environment. It's, it's not hard to get started with. I think. Um, Probably a lot of you have tried to use something like Minikube, where you have Kubernetes running on your local machine, and you don't need any infrastructure, really, to bring up a Kubernetes cluster at all. And that's, that's really easy to get started with. But if you're talking about running Kubernetes in an enterprise environment or in a production environment, then there's a lot more that you have to think about, a lot of considerations that you wouldn't have in just a development environment. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is security, because Kubernetes is kind of meant for you to run fast. It's, it's meant for you to go and get started very quickly, which means that some of the defaults that they've chosen are not the best for, for production. These are some quotes that I've taken directly out of the Kubernetes documentation. Um, you see that, by default, Kubla is unsecured. So any work, uh, worker node that you have, if someone were to gain access to that network and were able to ping that node, well, they could run whatever workload they want on that worker node. Um, you also have to think about things like user authentication. In fact, here's basically a list of the security considerations that you have to, have to worry about when you're bringing up a production Kubernetes cluster. If you want to have actual users, well, you need to give Kubernetes an external user, an external authentication provider. So how, how are you going to do that? How are you going to get those components to talk together? How are you going to tie that into your authorization and like governance infrastructure so that those users can only access the resources that they're supposed to? You have to worry about certificate management because Kubernetes is kind of decentralized, right? It's kind of modular, and all the pieces ideally should be communicating using mutual TLS, which means that you need to manage certificates. You have to worry about securing Kubelet. You have to worry about securing etcd, which is the brains of this whole operation. You have to worry about credential rotation for your service accounts. And you also have to worry about securing things like the dashboard that people often forget and lead to uh, hackers running cryptocurrency miners in your infrastructure. 
So like none of these things are things that, that none of these problems are really insurmountable or anything like that. They're just an additional factor that you have to consider when what you really want is to just get a cluster up and running. In addition, like I mentioned before, Kubernetes is modular. Like all the pieces are meant to work not necessarily, like they're meant to work together, but they can operate without the presence of each other. Which means that, like for example, your kubelet processes on your worker nodes will pretty much run no matter what you do. And if, and if they're running and you get them talking to your master, well, you'll be able to schedule a pod workload on, onto that worker. But just because you've done that successfully doesn't mean that all of these deployment workload types are going to work for you. Doesn't mean that just because you've deployed a single pod that you're gonna be able to deploy like a daemon set or a cron job or set up some custom resource in your cluster and expect that to work. So like these are all things that you have to consider and it makes it a little bit difficult to test this because how can you be confident that you have a conformant cluster? And even if you have a conformant cluster up front, how do you know that cluster is gonna continue operating the way that you want it to after you take down, for example, some of your workers for maintenance? How are you confident that your kubelet is going to be able to come up successfully or that your cluster is going to survive an upgrade? So again, a lot of things to think about when deploying Kubernetes in production, because it's like essentially infrastructure, and that means that you have to think about all the ramifications that come with that infrastructure. And last, you throw networking into this picture and it gets just a lot more complicated. If you want a resilient cluster, well that means that you need highly available masters. And there's no way Kubernetes gives you built in to have that master high availability which means that you need to go and set up your own load balancing solution or if you're using some sort of cloud infrastructure there, well you need to set up an external load balancer. So this is again taken directly from the Kubernetes documentation, that quote and this diagram. This is what they suggest you set up by yourself if you want a resilient, highly available master. So that, that's like a lot of work for us. And then you throw in mutual TLS into all of this, you throw in DNS, and then you have to worry about like this situation. If you have that load balancer sitting in front of your masters, then your workers need to talk to the master nodes through that load balancer. How are you gonna ensure that your masters are presenting an SSL certificate that's going to be accepted by the workers? And what if you need to rotate that certificate like over time, or for example, the IP address of your load balancer changes? or the DNS name of it changes. How are you gonna ensure that all these certificates are accepted by both the masters and the workers? So like this is, it's, it, like I said, like none of this is really, it's not something that you can't do, it's just a lot to think about. So what's the solution to all this? So this is how Piotr and Google start collaborating it, and Bosch has super features that allows us to do this. With repeatable deployments using Bosch, it's much easier to test everything and resurrecting VMs, it's all great features of Bosch. But today I want to specifically talk about two recently new features. Recently it's one and a half year old features that Bosch provides us that allowed us to build Cloud Foundry container runtime and allowed us to manage multiple clusters. One of it is Bosch DNS. It allows us to remove load balancer out of equation. With Bosch DNS, it provides easy master HA, and if you use it, just specify some alias, and it works like, kind of like internal load balancer. And if master goes down, then it gets removed from this DNS record. And with this, it's, you don't need external load balancer for internal communication. If you need to talk externally, you want it, you can have it, but you don't need it. And more importantly, you operator doesn't need to configure anything. So it works all the same for different clusters. It provides search discovery for different clusters, discovery of etcd, or discovery of masters from workers. So this way, it just works the same on different clusters. But additionally, we want to generate certificates and CredHub. CredHub really solved all those problems. We are able to generate certificates for all the components, provide mutual TLS, generate all the passwords, especially ones that you don't 
really care that required only for internal communication. It significantly simplifies multiple cluster management because operator doesn't need to think about it. They just have one manifest and have to change deployment name, and that's it. And I will show how it's happened right now. So I'll just deploy generic CFCR cluster. To be honest, I, I already deployed it, so we will have time to see some other things. And I will just, so I get sample manifest from Kubo deployment. It's manifest that provided by CFCR. This is minimal manifest. You can deploy it on each IS. It will work fine. So like, if you don't need any cloud features, it will work fine. If you need some collaboration with cloud, like connecting disks or load balancers, you need to provide settings for so-called cloud provider. And that's why I connect this additional ops file. Then one more thing, collocate errands. There will be session about collocate errands. What you need to know, it will speed up your deployment. Then I, because I want this cost to be accessible externally, I will add load balancer AP to the certificate, add masters to this load balancer, and provide some variables. So those variables are required to tag VMs, so cluster knows, okay, these VMs are part of this cluster, they can attach disks, and so on, and these variables are required to talk to GCP. And I'll click enter, it will run, it will take about one minute, and as I said, the first part of the manifest is available for any cloud, and when CFCR says that they're adding support for different clouds, it just means that they add cloud provider support for different clouds. Now, each developer or a Kubernetes developer or Kubernetes operator expects some workloads to be running on vanilla cluster. So one of it is kubedns, which allows service discovery inside the cluster. Kubernetes dashboard that you can see in pretty UI what's happening with the cluster, and a hipster for metrics. So this is what is done in this errand. And because I use collocate errand, it will run very, very quickly because it's run on the master VM. And it's already finished. Now it's getting logs and print out logs. So I will show how it works, just part of the manifest. So I added one job to the master and moves it a separate instance group. Then this is ops file for the load balancer. I just add VM extension and IP, just IP in variable. Now I want to connect to the cluster. So I, all my credentials are in CredHub. I need to get them from CredHub and this is, I get client secret, connect to this CredHub, it's connected, get the token that I used to authenticate, get the CA certificate, and set my kube config. Set kube config and kube, kube CTL, for example, get nodes. I can see it's up and running. It's available externally, so I will connect to my local machine and I can do kube CTL, kube CTL get all, get nodes as well. It will be the same nodes. So what I can do, I can deploy some workload, kube CTL, apply with file, persistent volume, file, create disk, create some deployment, it's up and running, and still proxy. As I said, it, it has dashboard, so I can access dashboard from my local machine, and loading, loading, okay. It says I need to log in. And I need to provide my kubectl file, kubeconfig file. I will provide it, and I can sign in and proceed. So even if your dashboard is exposed, you still need some syntaxes. And it's like deploying. You can see that I start deploying this guest book, and something is deployed, some nice UI. If I refresh it, it will update something, I hope. Yeah, everything is up and running. So cluster is up and running. I will go back to the remote VM and I can get kubectl get service frontend so I know how to connect to it. And this is 
let's go guestbook. It's up and running. It's run on public API address, so you can hello CF Summit. You can connect to it, but, but please don't, because don't steal internet. You can connect to it afterwards. So I deployed cluster. I used Scratch Hub to get credentials. I deployed using vanilla CFCR. I added some ops files just to optimize speed of uh, the deploying errands. I get access to it, it's working. But in real life, you probably don't want to expose your masters to the external internet. You want them to be available internal network, and then you need to have some kind of jump box to access it. And this is what we will do right now. We will, I will show the several pa possible patterns that you can use to connect to your cluster that deployed in just internal network. So I come back here and I go here and I will, I deploy second cluster as well, the same CFCR manifest, same cloud provider, Calicate errand, expose links, I will explain later why, rename deployment, and nothing about load balancer. So it doesn't, it's not run as part of load balancer, it's not available externally. And basically I won't be able to access it anyway except from going somehow from internal network. So I will deploy errand. And to do this, I will deploy jump box separately in the, with the same Bosch. So fetch and logs. I will show exposed links, it just basically exposing links and making them available between cross deployment. Jambox, I also deployed Jambox, I deployed everything, just half an hour, it's not that much. And manifest of this Jambox. I have Bosch DNS to be able to use the same service discovery, but from different deployment. This is why I had this links shared, because those links provide this DNS discovery using Kubernetes aliases. I can connect to the cluster with the same DNS name from this jump box. Then kubectl is one of the, I, I wrote this tiny job to show how you can access the cluster from jump box. And squid is simple HTTP proxy and nothing more interesting. So again, the same, connect to Cred Hub. And as you see, it has to, uh, two sets of deployment, one from CFCR, another for CFCR staging that I just deployed, and this has been generated automatically, I haven't done anything. And in CFCR staging, there are lots of credentials, and I basically don't care what are they. If I need, I can rotate any of them, but as operator, I don't need to have them on my computer at all. I'll get the token, I'll get the CA sort, and now I'll try to connect with this CA sort, with this token to master CFCR internal, which is DNS alias for this cluster. And unfortunately it doesn't work because I actually need Jambox. So I'll get Jambox and I'll get connect to the Jambox. So the script will get Jambox API address and using the Jambox, I will try to get some information. So I got those nodes, as you can see. Ah, don't show it. And now I'll deploy simple Nginx application that I got from CFCR. And just wait for it to finish. And it's deployed, so sometimes it takes time to download images, but I tried it several times, so all the images are there. This is why it deployed so quickly. And now I need to wait till load balancer is up. But unfortunately it says ensure load balancer. So it's still starting up. And I need to wait for some time. I need to access the cluster. So I want to, to show you how you can access cluster from this jump box. And maybe it won't be jump box for you. Maybe it will be some VM in your CI. Maybe in concourse worker. So I will just connect to this jump box SSH. And what's important from it, I can obviously an lookup master CFCR internal. 
catch three masters, they all advanced. So we have HA, and then I get var, recap, jobs, kubectl, pin, kubectl again, get service. And I can see that my Nginx is up and running. And this kubectl job is just simple. I have token, I have certificate authority, and I can show you token because this class is not available externally. You won't be able to connect to it. But we can connect to this workload. Okay, so let's recap a little bit. I deployed cluster without external access, deployed Jumpbox and show how you can access it. You can access it via HTTPS proxy, or you can create your own job that will run and execute commands on that cluster directly and developers won't even need to know anything about kubectl. And workloads will be still available externally. So that's it that we wanted to show you. There are much more things and there will be much more topics on this uh, today and tomorrow. So first is important link is manifest with, uh, for CFCR. Use stacked version if you want tested versions. Next link is link with demo and link with my Jumpbox deployment. So you can t t see how it works, how it works with links. So I hope that today you learned that Kubernetes is relatively easy to deploy and if you want, you can use it. And if you want to deploy it manually, it's much, much harder. Thank you all and we need you. We as CFCR team, we need you to help us collaborate better between Cloud Foundry application runtime and Cloud Foundry container runtime. Give your so connect other services, Cloud Foundry things to container runtime so it can be better. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Okay, question was if we allow user to provide custom cloud provider or do they have to configure it all the time? So this cloud provider is provided by Kubernetes and basically operator needs to configure it if you want to access the cloud. You need to configure something. You need to have credentials, which I've set using cloud config in Bosch and you need to set some parameters. In future, in long, long, long future, what we want, and it's Bosch Cloud Provider. We want Kubernetes to talk to Bosch and say, please give me disk. And Bosch will create disk attached to this node and it will work. Or Bosch give me load balancer, which potentially might happen. There is there are something in, in the Bosch nodes. So in the future, you'll use Bosch built-in settings and you won't need to configure this cloud provider at all. But for now, yes, you need to configure it, set some settings, and yeah, there are some limited set of settings. They're all in documentation. Yes, another question? Uh, so right now, project does not support it. I think, so, theoretic, I, I haven't tried. Okay, it's not, it's not supported. I haven't tried, but it's possible because of links. It's possible to get this. If you deploy etcd with uh, Bosch separately, you can get access to the etcd from the master and it doesn't need to be collocated. It can be external or it can be run on separate VM, but I don't think it's officially supported. So there might be some issues. You, know, you have to do it manually and check it manually. If something does not work, team will help you and 
I suppose they will solve it. I s question was is uh, do you want to scale by three masters uh, and if uh, CFCR comes by default with one master. In version 016, that last released version, it comes with one master. With version 017, that is not released yet. The, we, I, I don't sure what will be the defaults, but it's possible to use three masters. And this is, come on, this is what I've, this is what I've done. So I, from this jump box, if I would go again, I have three masters and it works. But yeah, work is not finished on three masters. Team is still working and there are some caveats, some edge cases that they're covering. Yes, another question? So DNS is, it's very, so it's, we use Bosch DNS. I'm not completely sure how it works, but I know that we have DNS daemon that runs on the local VM, and it actually talks to local VM to get DNS records. I suppose a director has some sets, like information about which VMs are up and which are down, in particular deployments. But, so I don't think that there's like something big running on the, on the director. I suppose all running locally, but I don't know details. If you really want to find out, there will be Bosch office hours after the stock. Come and ask Dmitry. Oh, I know, I'm not sure if it's well documented right now. So come and ask Dmitry. Yes? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Question: Why do you want to run Kubernetes with Cloud Foundry? So there are two parts. One part is why do you want to run Kubernetes? And if you, if you, so I will answer it a little bit later. Why do you want to run Kubernetes with Cloud Foundry? If you have Cloud Foundry, you probably want operator to have the same tool to operate your other deployments. So that's kind of obvious, but why do you want to run Kubernetes? There are several use cases. One of them is using disks, like persistence. It's, uh, it's supporting Cloud Foundry, but uh, as far as I know, Kubernetes has more configuration with it. Then extensibility, it's very big part, so it's really easy to extend Kubernetes. And some developers that get used to Kubernetes, they, like, they prefer Kubernetes to Cloud Foundry. There are some legacy workloads that it's very hard to run on Cloud Foundry and very easy to run on Kubernetes. There are some patterns like running sidecars and, for example, some specific routing. If you want to have specific routing, you have to go to Kubernetes. You can't go on Cloud Foundry and change your routing. UDP, you can run on Kubernetes, you can't run on Cloud Foundry. GPU, we will probably, with new stem cells, we'll be able to run GPU workloads with Kubernetes. I'm not, I'm not sure what will happen with Cloud Foundry. I don't know. So there's like some use cases, but yes, one more question. Uh, so question was about IPv6 and persistence, if we run with any issues with IPv6 and persistence. I, I don't know. I'm not, so right now I'm not part of the CFCR team and I don't know what are the issues with IPv6, what is the current state. And with persistence, I know that there are so many easy ways to shoot yourself in 
in your feet and make it not work and like, break it. And there are so many configurations that we covered most of them, but some of them just don't work because we don't know about specific configurations. Yes, another question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. question was, do we want to have ingress control embedded in the Cloud Foundry container runtime? I don't think there is a push to get it embedded to Cloud Foundry container runtime. So theoretically, you can run it on your own. Uh, you can deploy it with Kubernetes. Then Kubernetes will have to handle it and watch for the, like, that it's alive and do health checks. It's, it's, it's working, I know that. Yeah, so it's, we, I don't think there's a plan to, 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 to it to be a part of something that's called Foundry Container Runtime Team will do. But if someone else will do it, they will support it, that's the thing. Like, it's, this is why we said we need you. We need you to help us and deliver such features. Okay, no questions, no more questions. Thank you, I will be on the Pivotal booth after lunch, so come if you have any questions and ask. Thank you.